There is a famous drawing by an English engraver of the early 19th century, very famous man, Henry Moses. The drawing was done in 1820. It depicts a, there it goes. It depicts a whimsical game played in France, usually by young lovers, and Moses' drawing is entitled, The Decision of the Flower. Now, this is a picture of the original drawing, so you might not can see it so well up close, and what this young lady is doing, so I will show it to you this way, and then you will realize it and recognize it as a little game that since 1820, for 200 years now, some people have played, some young lovers have played, especially middle school girls and high school girls. The decision of the flower, he loves me, he loves me not. Hopefully her flower doesn't have a whole lot of petals because on and on it goes and whatever is said in the last petal becomes the answer to her curiosity. Well, in the book of 1 John, and particularly here in chapter 3, the Apostle John is playing a similar game, but he's not just mulling over a curiosity, he's examining a definite reality. When he thinks about the love of God, he says to us over and over again in chapters 3, 4, and 5 that we're about to enter, he loves me. And he's going to say over and over again in these three chapters about the world and its value system, it loves me not. God loves me. The world and its worldview and value system loves me not. And that's the dilemma of every follower of Jesus. Jesus loves me this I know, for the Bible tells me so, but also my experiences tell me so. But at the same time, it doesn't take much for us to realize the world can be cruel. The world does not love us. So in our text, the first few verses of 1 John chapter 3, the Apostle John takes us on a little tour. He starts with what we are now followed by what has not yet been revealed, then on to what we shall be, and then back to who has this hope that is in Jesus. So our journey goes from now to not yet, to what we shall, to how it will be. See how very much our Father loves us. For He calls us His children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that because we are God's children because they don't know Him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but He has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. Now, like many of you, I grew up mostly in the 60s and the early 70s, and the only translation of the Bible I ever remember reading in my home church throughout the 60s was the King James Version. In fact, there weren't a whole lot of other versions at the time, but particularly, we, we pretty well only used the King James Version. I don't know that anybody said it wasn't good or right to use another version. We just didn't do it. And so the King James Version is what I memorized a lot as a young person, as a young preacher, and I just love the way the King James Version describes verse 1. Because it says, behold, <laughs> what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. It's like, it's like there's this truth that has just reached out and grabbed John and shook him to his inner core. Behold, look at this, he's saying. 
You're not going to believe this truth. Check this out. And what is that truth? God loves us so much that he wants to make us his children. He found a way to call us his kids. And so this is what we'll do when we think about this magnificent truth. This is what we'll do. We will just sort of stand there for a moment in awe and say, Behold! Behold, let's just behold a bit. The Greek word potapos here is the word that is translated manner. What manner of love is this? You know what it literally means? It literally means from what country? From what country? The word literally means the behavior or trait indicative of a particular country. Maybe you've heard the old joke, I like it, that heaven is where the police are British, the cooks are Italian, the mechanics are German, the lovers are French, and it's all organized by the Swiss. Hell is where the police are German, the cooks are British, the mechanics are French, the lovers are Swiss, and it's all organized by the Italians. Now, if you didn't get that, it's, it's on you. It's not on me. I'm just telling you, it's on you. Think of all the different countries in the world, and they're all known for their particular proclivities. For some reason, good at some things, maybe not so good at others. And the same is true of heaven. The God in heaven is known of a specific manner of love, type of love that cannot be experienced anywhere else in the whole universe. That's right. Totally unique kind of love. Now, our world is not without its types of love. There's the strong love of a father. There's the tender, sweet love of a mother. There's the longing love of children for their parents. There's the lasting love of siblings. There's the loyal love of good friends. There's the passionate love of spouses. There are all kinds of love in the world, and we're glad about that, is the old saying, love makes the world go round. But behold, this is a special type of love. Behold, this manner of love that God has for us. In other words, there's a greater form of love than what can be found in any earthly relationship. There's a love, a manner of love that is literally out of this world from another world. Think of the manner of love it took for the eternal holy God to make children out of sinful rebellious creatures like us. Think of the kind of manner of love it took to make us kids of the king. And all you can say is John, one who had experienced firsthand Jesus Christ, the one who was closest to him of anybody on earth, the one who had gone to Patmos and saw the revelation directly from God, he even says, behold, what manner of love is this? He says, to be called the children of God. What manner of love is this to be called the children of God? See, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but basically there are three ways you can enter a family. The first way is to be born into that family. You enter through the rigors of birth. A seed gets planted and it grows. A womb contracts. There's pressure and pushing. A baby comes out through blood and water. 
You're born into a family. By the way, all of those analogies I just used, I used on purpose because those are also similar to the way that we are born into the family of God. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus said, well, how can a man be, when he is old, go back into his mother's womb and be born? And he said, except a man is born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter. So we enter the kingdom of God. So we're born into God's family the same way. But the second way to enter a family is to be adopted. I've attended in my years in ministry dozens and dozens of legal adoptions. Paperwork gets filed. Laws and courts are as definitive as blood and water because an adopted child has the exact same rights as a birth child. I, look, I know, I've been to a lot of these, and I've stood there as the judge speaks down to the parents holding that adopted child and says to them, do you swear and know that this child has the same rights as your birth children? Yes, absolutely. And this was the hope of all Gentile Christians in the New Testament. God's promise of salvation initially was to the Jews But those of us who lack Jewish blood can be thankful. God put into place an adoption for us to be children of God. And so we enter his family through that legal, biblical principle. And a third way to enter a family is by marriage. A man and a woman form a union. They make a holy and permanent vow and commitment to each other. And this too happens to believers. That's why the New Testament describes Jesus having taken a bride and the church is the bride of Christ and the church is the people. And so therefore, we've entered God's family a third way. Through the love principle. Now, I find this interesting. The Hebrews never referred to God as Abba or Father in any personal sense. Abba means Papa. The, the Hebrews never, ever, you go all the way through the Old Testament, you'll never find them referring to God as Papa, as Abba, as Father in any kind of a personal sense. He might be called occasionally the Father of the nation. But no individual, look it up, ever addressed the Almighty God as Father until Jesus. And it was one of the things that caused the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law to be so angry at him for, is that he would would claim a personal relationship with God the Father. This is what blows John, the apostle's mind, in our text this morning too. He and the other disciples overheard Jesus praying. I think it's night, isn't it? I took a nap this afternoon, so it seems like morning to me. He he overheard Jesus calling God Father, Papa, Terms of endearment, the closest possible relationship possible. And if that wasn't staggering enough, when Jesus taught his own disciples to pray, not just himself, when he taught his own disciples to pray, he told them to address God in the same way he had. His intention was to place them on the same level with the God that he was enjoying. And so they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And it's been true of all Christians since. The fellowship we now have with Jesus has made the sovereign God who sits on the orb of the universe, our Father. No wonder John said, Behold, 
What manner of love this is. Now, I've got to pull over here in part for just a second. Because I know some people in this auditorium, undoubtedly in a crowd this size, well, I know some personally, period, had a not-so-good father growing up. More of a dud than a dad. And so when you hear the name father, it doesn't excite you as much as it should. I'm not going to tell through the whole story here, but I had a young uh, girl, a teenage girl, who was one of my bus captains uh, in Chapel Hill, Tennessee, the first job we had after Diane and I got married. And, and uh, so one night we'd taken the last kids home and we were on the way back. And she said, when we get back to the building, can we just talk for a second? I said, yeah. I said, we can talk now, and I was, but I was driving the bus. And she said, no, I really need your full attention. And we got back, and she said, you know, during the devotional, you talked about God as our Father, and you talked about some of the very similar things I'm saying tonight. And she said, I just, I can't grasp that. My Father either hates me, or he certainly acts like he hates me. He beats me. He's very hard on me and my younger sister. I really can't stand him. And he said, in fact, he never has called me by my name. The only name I can remember that he ever has called me by is my little five-letter word, and it starts with a B. Some of you have had a situation similar to that in your life. So God being your father doesn't exactly evoke in you uh, behold, <laughs> what manner, what type of love is this? And so when you hear the word father, it just doesn't do much for you. Now, I want you to listen to me if that's you tonight. It's very important. Don't let that earthly man, an earthly father, if you had a poor one, rob you again and again and again by distorting a relationship with such immense potential for good in your life like God being your father is. Don't let him reshape your image and feelings about fathers in general so you can't understand that there is an ultimate father, God, who loves you, gave his one and only son for you, and wants to save you for all eternity as an heir in his kingdom. If you had that kind of an experience, he has stolen and taken enough from you already. Don't let him take that. Don't let him take that. And so, I might ask tonight, kindly, who's your daddy? And let it take on a whole new meaning, because your answer can be, behold, what manner of love this is, that God is my Abba, my Papa, my Father. My daddy. See, Jesus, we read in the last half of verse 1, was God in the flesh. He knew the mysteries of creation. He understood each person he came in contact with better than they even knew themselves. And yet Jesus himself was brushed aside by the masses as a mere teacher. He was accused by the religious establishment of being a charlatan, not being real. He was ultimately executed as a blasphemer. Obviously, Jesus was never recognized or appreciated for who he really was either. And that's the Christian's dilemma. In Christ, we are co-heirs with Jesus, kids of the King, Members of God's forever family, and yet in the world and in its system, we're either brushed aside and ignored or scoffed at and persecuted. We're not recognized and appreciated for who we really are. And it's getting worse every year. And it shouldn't surprise us. Because this world is not our home. We're just a passing through, the old hymn says. 
God loves me, the world loves me not. That's just the truth. You know who movie star Helen Hunt is? Helen Hunt is on the left side of the screen. She is a very successful leading lady and director of films. In 1997, she won an Oscar for Best Actress. She's won four Emmys. She's won four Golden Globe Awards. You would think she would be recognized. But she told the story recently on her Twitter account of how she was mistaken for another actress, Jodie Foster. At her own, who is also on the screen, at her own neighborhood Starbucks. You know how when you go into Starbucks and they'll ask for your name so they can write it on the cup, right? So they didn't ask for her name. And she said, don't you need my name? And they said, no, no. We know who you are. We just won't say it out loud. And when she picked up her order, it said, we got you, hashtag Jody Foster. <laughs> And so she went home and tweeted that to the whole world. And my friends, just like the barista who didn't really recognize the famous movie star, this world doesn't recognize us either. It doesn't treat us as special. It just doesn't care about us. Christians on the whole are completely left out in the modern discourse of life. And it's continuing to get more and more that way every single year. I read a fascinating article in the Wall Street Journal last week about how Christians in the Silicon Valley stay quiet. If they go to church, if they are believers, they do not say one word about it ever at work because if they do, they'll get fired. They can't risk saying one word about it. And, and all day they hear fellow co-workers ridiculing people of faith, ridiculing people of morality, ridiculing people of values. It's a perfect example of the text tonight. The world just does not care about you. Don't be shocked if they treat us the same way they treated Jesus. But here's what's really important. Don't let the way the world treats you affect the way you feel about Jesus. Amen. That's the important thing to say. We cannot let the way the world treats us affect the way we feel about Jesus and the way we see ourselves. That happens far too often. The way we should see ourselves is as kids of the king. Behold, what manner of love is it that God has made us his children? Colossians 3.3 says, For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Mm. So in, there's a large sense in which we're like an iceberg. The largest part of who we are and what we have is out of sight beneath the surface. But that doesn't mean we don't have it. And that doesn't mean that's not who we are. It just means the world, when it looks at us, might not see much of us at all. All the world might see is the tip of the iceberg if they're even looking hard enough to see that. That's why we're laughed at. That's why we're ridiculed. That's why we're misconstrued and misunderstood. A Christian has given their all to a kingdom and a king that other people cannot see. In other words, our life is hidden with Christ in God. Yet one day our situation will change big time. The second verse in our text tonight says, Dear friends, we are already God's children, but He has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ 
appears. In other words, God has not yet let the cat out of the bag. (laughs) But one day he will. And when he does, everybody will be in awe of us. When Jesus appears in the clouds, we'll be on cloud nine. We'll be at the top. And the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. Jesus said. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're told that one day soon, Jesus will return for his church. He'll snatch us up in the air to be with him. And Colossians 3, 4 says, And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Verse 2 also says, we know that we will be like him, for we shall see him as he really is. In the old King James Version, it says the words that became a hymn that I grew up singing a lot when I was uh, young called Face to Face with Christ. How many of you remember that hymn? Face to Face with Christ my Savior. Face to Face. What will it be? I'll tell you what it'll be. It'll be, behold, what manner of love this is. But one truth is certain that we do know now, and that is a change is mandatory. About the future, there are holes in our understanding, some of the details about our resurrection bodies and about, as we talked about last week, some of it depends on your view of the millennial. Some of the details are a little murky, but here's what we do know. Pay attention to what we do know directly from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I'll tell you in a minute why. We cannot inherit the kingdom of God in the body we have right now. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. Our current bodies are not fit for our future environment. But he goes on. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die, our mortal bodies must be transferred into immortal bodies. We don't know what those are going to look like. I could speculate, and I could make pretty good speculation, I think, based on biblical evidence. I do know this. There are certain bodies that are just not made for certain environments. What this text has said is our earthly bodies right now is not made for the heavenly environment. When man went to the moon, if you believe that kind of thing really happened, I don't. But if... uh, When man went to the moon, they had to have special spacesuits made for them because if they'd gotten out of that capsule on the moon in just their earthly bodies, it was not fit for that unearthly environment. And man could never survive like that on the lunar surface. Our bodies aren't fit for lunar life. Likewise, the mortal bodies we currently inhabit aren't suited for heaven. And to survive the physical presence of God. And so, we wonder what will our future heavenly bodies be like? What kind of characteristics will they possess? How will they behave under pressure? Imagine a body no longer vulnerable to pain. Can you imagine that? This Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock, we're going to have the funeral for one of our beloved elders, Danny Osborne's wife, Lori Osborne, here in the building. For 13 years, she's just been unbelievable pain. Worst case of MS I ever saw in my life. And then it went into so many other things. And she's just been in constant pain and struggle for all these years. And so I told Danny the other night when I found out she had passed, imagine her body no longer vulnerable to pain and sickness and soreness. Think of inhabiting a body that never breaks down. That's got me kind of excited. How about you? And we can try to envision its capabilities, but John 
squelches our curiosity completely, basically, with just five words. We shall be like him. That's good enough for me. That's all I need to know. <laughs> we shall be like him. I don't need any more speculation. That's good enough. That's good enough for me. We'll have the same type of body with the same features that Jesus had after his resurrection. And I can't tell you everything that that means, but I can tell you some of the things that means. Jesus appeared over here, and then he appeared over here, and you didn't see him go from one to the other. Jesus walked through walls. He walked through doors in his resurrection body. He had no earthly limitations or boundaries in his resurrection body that his earthly body had. Recall how he just vanished from the disciples on the road to Emmaus and then just suddenly reappeared in the upper room in Jerusalem several miles away. And he didn't even fly there like Superman as far as we could see. He just did. He had no limitations of time or space. Now, I'm not sure what we shall be like him includes, but I am sure of this. We'll be the envy of the angels, beautiful beyond description, like Jesus, because behold what manner of love this is. We'll be called the children of God. Hmm. People may be mocking us at the moment, but my friends, one day the followers of Jesus are definitely going to get the last laugh. No question about that. And then John tells us one more thing before we close. In verse 3, all who have this hope in him, all who have this hope in him, I have that hope in him to you, says all. All who have this hope in him should purify themselves just as he is pure. Hope is a confidence in the future. So here's the big question for us. How many of us ever really focus on the future? I do a lot. Do you know it's one of the distinguishing characteristics between us and any of the animals, even the higher animals? They don't think about the future. They don't. It's what separates us with a soul and a spirit from the animals. In fact, Harvard psychologist Daniel Gilbert wrote in one of his books, Human beings think about the future in a way that no other animal can, does, or ever has. And this simple, ordinary act is the defining feature of our humanity. John says that this is good when we think about ultimate and eternal destiny. It should motivate us to live a godly life in the present, to live with purity. A forward focus is the key to a purer present. That's what he's saying here. So I tried to picture that in my mind. What, the, what would that be like? I'm thinking about a young lady in high school who lands a date to the prom with the high school heartthrob, the one she's been watching for years. Trust me, she won't be idle 30 minutes before he picks her up for that date. She won't be distracted and worried about all the other things going on in the world. She's prepping and primping and styling and smiling. She wants to look her very best when he appears. And likewise, we, the bride of Christ, should want to be at our very best, our very purest. All who have this hope in him should purify themselves as they look for his appearing. So let me ask you, are you living between two worlds? Are you picking flower petals, so to speak? You know, God loves me and the world loves me not. God loves me and the world loves me not. God loves me, and the world loves me not. And if it ends up on the world loves me not, that's where you'll park, and that's where your life will be distracted. 
For some reason, you're still picking and you're still playing a game and living your life in limbo, not quite sure where it will come down. I'm telling you, this text says, oh, you should be sure where it'll come down. You should be sure it'll come down on He loves me. Behold what manner of love that is. You're His child and heir. Enjoy it and live like it. 